Good morning and welcome to All Saints Church. My name is Rob Graff. I serve as rector and I greet you all this morning in the precious life-giving name of Jesus. He is Savior. He is Lord. Amen. Amen. I don't see too many visitors here at the 1030 service, but I know that we have many online. Visitors, we greet you. We welcome you. We want to come alongside you. So let us know who you are. Also reminding folks during these COVID days while we're videotaping services to please send in pictures. We can stay connected with one another, see what each other might be up to through these pictures. So send them in to info at allsaintspaulis.org. We're receiving Holy Communion in one kind during these days in bread only. So we have families receiving the wine representing all of us. Right before we step into the communion time together, you'll see that family come forward. When they receive, know that you are receiving as well. So we'll have Dee and Pete Saletti uh, joining us as whiners this morning. Thank you all for doing that. Angel gifts have pretty much all been taken, and we're purchasing our gifts, and we're making sure those gifts are wrapped and back into the church office by the, the 11th of December. And if for some reason you were not able to get one of those families, you can still join in. If you want to find a new jacket, small, medium, large in the children's sizes, Teach My People would love to have a brand new jack jacket suitable for our climate. And you can bring that into the church office. We'll make sure one of those children receive, receives that jacket. So you can bring that in unwrapped by December 11th. That would be a blessing. And we're so thankful for these Advent devotionals. If you haven't found them online, they're on the website. You can click on that uh, setting in your phone or on your computer and make sure that they're sent to you automatically with via notification. It's a real blessing. These Advent devotionals are outstanding, and we're so thankful for those who took the time to hear the Lord and then write. We can give thanks right now. If you want to lift up your... That means clap. If you want to clap for those who... You know, if I was in a Baptist church, they would have known immediately to clap. So thankful for those who did the writing. Christmas Eve 2020 is going to be a little bit different. We'll be across the street. We'll be under the big top, under the tent at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And by the end of that service, it'll be dark. And we'll have our candles and we'll be singing Silent Night, Holy Night. It'll be a solemn, awesome um, way to end that service. Bring your friends. Let your friends and neighbors know that there's a service, a community service on the rectory lawn just for them. And uh, we'll lift up the name of Jesus together. That'll be the only service we do on Christmas Eve, which means we need to find a place to do pickup pageant for the, ch for the children. We'll be doing that on the 20th, Advent 4, 1030, right here in the large sanctuary. Pickup pageant. Help spread the word, December 20th. We have prophetic words. Week in, week out. And sometimes we can become blind to them. We can become numb to them. We're not even seeing them or reading them. So I want to make sure you're paying attention to the prophetic words that come through this church family. This one jumped out at me for this week. Hunter, what are you looking for? I am here, says the Lord. I have your answers. And that undoubtedly may be for someone within or without this congregation who's named Hunter. But I, as I say my prayers, I'm wondering if it's, if it's not for someone who is a hunter and identifies himself or herself as being a hunter. And the Lord is saying, I see you. I am here. The Lord is saying, I have your answers. Find them in me. Amen. Let's stand together. Holy Spirit, come in power. Rule and reign in this place and in this people. Let our expectations be worthy of the King who reigns. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Hymn 66.
Surely the Lord is coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The reading today is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 18. A reading from 2 Peter. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should come, any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolve, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, Take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning once again. It's the second Sunday in Advent. Merry, Merry Advent to each and every one of you. Advent, of course, the season where we focus in on the coming of our Lord, not just the coming of the Christ child. We're not just getting ready for Christmas, but also the second coming, where he returns in power and great glory to claim all that he has won on the cross and in his people. Every Advent, as I'm preparing for Advent sermons, I inevitably come back to a memory some nearly 25 years ago now. Seeing a car drive, drive by me on the highway and had a bumper sticker on the back and it said, Jesus is coming back. And underneath it, it said, look busy. And I laughed out loud. And I laughed out loud because that's, that's where my heart is when I think of Advent. That's so often where the church is when we think of Advent. What is this coming again in power and great glory? Judgment, separating, I don't know, do something churchy. You know, may, hope, hopefully we'll be found doing something churchy. And we're missing. I want us to think of a different coming. A coming rooted in relationship. If you hear anything I say this morning, I want you to hear this. It's not about looking busy. It's not about pretending to do something churchy or even in actuality doing anything churchy. It's about being found in him. That our peace might be rooted in him, in the relationship 
that we have in Christ Jesus. So Lord, open up your word to us and open up our hearts to your word that we might be transformed, that we might be made new, or that we might be ready for all that you have for us today and tomorrow and in the years to come. We don't want to just look busy. We want to be found in you. We want to be in your peace, seeing you do your good works through us. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus is coming back. Look busy. I was thinking of those opportunities that we all have in married life when our our spouse leaves us for a season to go take care of family or to go take care of work or maybe it's to go be with family and from time to time Braden leaves me she always comes back but from time to time she leaves me and she'll go back and take care of family or take care of parents or take care of baby Annie and be with Margaret Braden and Jack it's it's just part of our rhythm and she'll leave me with sometimes by myself or sometimes with one child or two or three or whatever it may be and when she leaves I always institute new rules and one of my favorite rules is the one cup rule here's your cup and this is your cup until mom returns why would I why would I institute the one cup rule it's because I don't want to see a bunch of dishes piled up in, in that sink, you know? It's going to be hard enough to take care of plates and forks, and you know, you can only use re- reuse plates so many times before you have to wash them. I don't want Braden to come home and have the sink piled up or the dishwasher dirty or clothes on the floor. And I know, even when I know when she's coming back, that it'll be at the very last minute, the very last hour, And I'll go take care of business and make sure things are in order for her return. It's not that way with the Lord, is it? We don't know when he's coming back. We we can't pile the dishes high and at the very last minute take care of business. It's not like that. The expectation is through, throughout the time away, we are keeping things tidy. The expectation is while we await the Lord's return, we are keeping things in order that we might be ready when he returns in power and great glory. No time for last minute cleanup. And in, in Peter's first letter, the emphasis is on grace. The grace of our Lord, this unmerited favor, the Lord making a way. In the second letter of Peter, the emphasis is on knowledge of the Lord, knowing him, being transformed by the knowledge of the Lord. But this kind of knowledge is a little bit different than we might assume that it is. It's emphasizing gnosko knowing, gnosis knowledge. It's emphasizing the kind of knowledge that comes from relationship, not from religion. It's not a Jesus is coming, look busy kind of thing. It's the knowledge that comes from pressing in and knowing him and being known by a loving God. Here in the second letter that Peter writes, in the third chapter, He's warning us that scoffers will come. Scoffers will come at the the end of time and mock us. Jesus said he's coming again, they'll say. Where is this Jesus who claimed to be returning, they'll say. In Peter's time, they were mocking. It'll, It'll be 70 years, they'll say. Where is this Jesus, supposedly the resurrected one? Jesus says, or Peter says, be of good heart. Don't listen to these mockers. Realize that Jesus is coming back, just as he said he was. He's coming back like a thief in the night when you least expect it. He's coming back on his timetable. For one day, Peter says, is like a thousand years for God. So don't be mindful of the scoffers. Trust the promises of Jesus. 
Peter emphasizes to the church, he emphasizes to us today that we should focus on the fact that the old will become new, that the old will pass away, that the old literally will be consumed by fire, heaven will be consumed by fire, this earth will be consumed by fire. All of our shame, all of our brokenness will be consumed by fire. This is good news. It will be replaced with a new heaven and a new earth. This new heaven and this new earth in which the righteousness of God will dwell forever. Amazing good news. But again, if you hear anything I say, hear this. It's not the religion. It's not what we have to do in our waiting. It's the relationship. It's whose we are in our waiting. Look at verse 14 with me. I'm in 2 Peter chapter 3. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, waiting for this end, waiting for his return, be diligent. Be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Be diligent to be found in him. Be diligent to be, be found for him. The emphasis here is relationship in him and at peace. In him without spot or blemish. I love the language. The language is intentional. Peter knows what he's doing. He's painting a picture for the early church. He's painting a picture for us this morning. He's not saying be perfect. Find it within yourself to be perfect. He's not saying try harder as you wait to be better. He's saying, let Jesus be your righteousness. Be found in him without spot or blemish. Who's the one without a spot or blemish? It's the lamb who was slain. It's Jesus who did what we could never do for ourselves, taking all of our sin and all of our shame to the cross, rising victoriously that all that believe on him, all that find life in him, who know him relationally, might be saved. This is important language he's using. Don't try harder to be better, but be found in him without spot or blemish. And in that, you will have peace. So it matters. It matters how we wait. And Peter, as we look through the verses that precede this, Peter's telling us exactly how it is that we should wait, starting this relationship, being found in him and at peace. The first thing I, I glean here is that it matters what we're waiting for. Make sure that you are waiting for this new heaven and this new earth. That you're not just eagerly anticipating and waiting for things to get better on this broken earth. Do you ever find yourself camped out there? That your heart's desire, your deepest longing is for temporal things? or earthly things of course we go there and we're warned against it our eyes are to be upward looking for his return not focusing down below on the brokenness of this earth it matters what you're waiting for the afterlife can be scary in time, talk can be a little disconcerting. So just remember, this new heaven, this new earth, church, this is what we were created for. What we're living in now is broken and fallen, and it won't be made right until he returns in power and great glory and ushers in a new heaven and a new earth. So as scary and as disconcerting as it may be, rest in the truth that this is what you were made for. This is what you were created for. If you're found in Christ Jesus, this is your destiny. The afterlife is not some spirit playing a harp on a cloud. You ever have that image? Don't even go there. We'll be given resurrected bodies. We'll be given soul to run around and enjoy this new earth, to be in relationship with one another like we were intended to be in relationship with one another, to be in relationship with a loving God the way we were originally intended to be in relationship with a loving God. Work 
will be returned to what it was intended to be all along. Not mindless toiling that never ends. But the kind of creative, life-giving work that we get a taste of in this world from time to time. But it's fleeting. Everything will be the way it was intended to be. And it will be good. John had a vision for this new earth and this new heaven. The beloved disciple. Looking, why don't you look with me if you have your Bibles. Revelation chapter 21. John writes this, this thread that runs through much of New Testament scripture describing what the afterlife will look like. John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Relationship. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. It matters as we wait, just what it is we're waiting for. We were created for so much more than this. Secondly, as we wait, we need to make room for others in our waiting. Make room for others. It matters. Why? Because Jesus, the one who put on flesh, who did what we couldn't do for ourselves, he came the first time and ushered in the end of days. And the promise is when he returns the second time, he will seal them. What am I saying? What I'm saying is we live in a special dispensation. We live in a special period of time. The time of his rule and reign. The time of the Holy Spirit. The time where we have an opportunity to press into the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit to be changed. That time is going to come to an end. So when we think about our children and our grandchildren, when we think about the neighbor across the street, we're not really sure where they are with the Lord. When we think about whoever it is, realize that time is short and it matters a great deal how it is that we are waiting. Are we making room for others in our waiting? There's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of intensity. In verse 9 of the same chapter 3, 2 Peter, Jesus makes it clear that it's his desire that none should perish, but all of us would be reaching out and finding true repentance. What does that mean for me and for you? Well, if, if you're on the outskirts of the faith, and it happens. We can grow up in the church and find ourselves playing church. If you're on the outskirts of the faith, looking in, this is an opportunity right now today to repent, to cry out to him, to say, I'm tired of playing games. Have all of me. I receive you as Lord. I receive you as Savior. Thank you for forgiving me and loving me so well. Some of you might do that today. What does it mean for us in this period of time of waiting as we make room for others? It means that we're looking for opportunities to come alongside those whom we love and maybe those whom we don't even really know. And we're loving and we're blessing and we're serving, we're forgiving. We're looking for opportunities to be the church while we have breath. We're looking for opportunities to tell our story. People can argue doctrine They can't argue with our story. Let me tell you what the Lord's done in my life. Let me tell you what the Lord did as I was going through my divorce. Let me tell you what the Lord did as I was burying my child. Let me tell you what the Lord did as I was recovering from bankruptcy. Let me tell you what the Lord did. Tell your story. Earn the right to lift up the name of Jesus as we work on relationships with the least and the lost and the lonely. We make room for others in our waiting. A third little something that bubbles up out of this passage as we wait. 
Never, ever forget the one fact of Advent. You all know the one fact of Advent, right? Some of you may have missed it. If you look with me to verse 8, I'm kind of giving you a hard time here. If you look with me to verse 8 of this chapter 3 in 2 Peter, we have the one fact of Advent, verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. This was important to Peter. It's important that we understand it, that we grab a hold of it. The one fact of Advent. What's Peter talking about here? This one day being like a thousand years. He's talking about the creator of time, our Lord, being outside of time. Think about it. He created the planets. He placed them in their courses. He created what we call chronological time. He's not subject to chronological time. He created it. He lives outside of time. What we call the Greek word in Kairos time. A good definition for Kairos time is it's all the time at the same time. One day is like a thousand years. Why is this so important in our waiting? I'll tell you. Spend some time thinking on Kairos time. Pray about it. Journal on it. Try to wrap your brain around it. What does it mean that our God lives in Kairos time? That one day is like a thousand years. It means that he has all of eternity to focus on you. Did you hear me? He has all of eternity to focus on you. And it's my belief that he does. That he never takes his eyes off of you. That means you're his favorite. I say that from time to time and people will kind of laugh. Huh, that's funny. No, I mean it. You're his favorite. If I understand scripture, I'm believing that I do. You're his favorite. Put your name there. You're his beloved. You're not on the periphery. You're not, you're not just somebody that squeaked in. He delights in you. If you were the only sinner in this fallen world, he would send Jesus to die for you. What does this Kairos time mean for us? It means that we, we can know and be known by a God who delights in us who never takes his eyes off of us. It means that he's never rushed. He's never in a hurry. He always has time for you. It means that God is never late. But it seems like he's late. And sometimes we're in that, that crucible moment and we're crying out and we're like, Lord, I got nothing left. Where are you? But I'm telling you, he's never late. He might take his time, but he's always on time. Is there anything you've grown weary of putting in front of him? Is there anyone you've grown weary of putting in front of him? Be reminded. He exists in Kairos time, where all time is at the same time. That means he can take all of eternity to answer your prayers. He can take all of eternity to focus on that one cry in the middle of the night. We serve an on-time God. Never forget the one fact of Advent. So we make sure that we are eagerly waiting a new heaven and a new earth. We're not just waiting for things to get better on this old, broken down earth. We're not just focused on things temporal. We're focused on things eternal. We make sure that we're making room for others in our waiting. There's a sense of urgency to the time that we have left. It matters who we're loving, who we're coming alongside. Thirdly, we make sure as we wait to never forget that one fact of Advent. To the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. Some of you are anxious. I know some of you are fearful. These are anxious and fearful days. But also, I know that some of you have some dishes that are piled high in the sink. You've got clothes on the floor. And you're anxious and you're fearful about what the return of the king might mean for you. And I want you to stop right there. 
I want you to hit the pause button right there and say, now, this is from the pit of hell. I'm not letting these thoughts direct my heart. I want you to go back to verse 14 of this chapter 3 in 2 Peter and be reminded, therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to what? Be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish. Be diligent then to be at peace. Even as we wait for his advent, we can press into his presence. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we can press into his presence. We can be found in him. We can be found at peace. So Lord, we look to you and we trust you. And some of us are so comfortable in this world that we find it hard to even pretend to look forward to the next world. Some of us, we don't know what it means to be in relationship with you. And I pray that you would break through. Let this Advent season be a breakthrough season. That we would look to you and find you mighty to save. Lord, that you would overwhelm us with your love. That you would overwhelm us with your grace and your forgiveness. That we would know you and your righteousness to be our righteousness. So come, Holy Spirit, have your way in each and every heart here and as we watch online. Help us in our waiting. We pray it all expectantly. Lord Jesus, in your holy and life-giving name, amen. We're going to maintain this posture of prayer as we pray for the whole state of Christ's church and we pray for the world. Most Holy Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the one who will be returning soon. Lord, I pray that you grant us hearts of expectation as we look forward to the day of his return. Father, I pray for your church here and throughout the world, the place where your gospel is proclaimed in power, that we may all be one, just as you and the Son are one. Lord God, I pray for the leaders of the church, remembering today especially our Archbishop Foley, our bishops Steve and David. Pray for our clergy, for Rob and Percy, Thad and myself. Empower us to continue to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. Lord God, in the cycle of prayer for churches in our community, we lift up House of God Church and the Reverend Johnny Ford. Bless them to be a blessing in this community. And for churches in, our, in the Diocese of the Carolinas, we pray for Church of the Redeemer in Clemson, South Carolina, and its pastor, the Reverend John Hall. Expand the area of their influence. Lord God, I lift up our staff and our vestry, asking that you would enlarge their vision, that you would bless them for their service to this body. Lord, I pray for our nation. I ask that you would pour out peace throughout this land, that you would continue to bind the spirit of lawlessness and pour out the spirit of forbearance on all people. We pray for our President Donald, our Governor Henry, and all elected officials. God, will you grant them wisdom from above. Enable them to seek your will above all else. Lord, I pray for this congregation that you would protect them, that you would bless them, that you empower each of them to look forward and hasten the day of your coming and the arrival of a new heaven and a new earth. Lord, we pray for those known to us who do not know you, that your Holy Spirit would open the eyes of their hearts, 
to see the glory and the love that you have for them through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that they would come to faith. We pray for those known to us who are sick, and I invite you to lift up names to the Lord now. God, we know that you heal today, and we know that you proclaim it's by the wounds of Jesus that we are healed. And we pray that you would send forth your healing touch to those who are hurting in mind, body, or spirit. Father God, let us be found in him your son, not having a righteousness of our own that comes from the law, but one that depends on faith, that may, we may truly know him and the power of his resurrection. May it be. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Remaining kneeling, let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. O oh, promised Christ, we are a world at war. Our peace depends on your coming. We are a sinful people. Our pardon depends on your coming. We are full of good intentions, but weak at keeping promises. We humbly ask for your forgiveness. Our only hope of doing God's will is that you should come and help us do it. Lord Christ, word made flesh, our world waits for your peace, for your pardon, and for your grace. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. You may be seated. We are now moving towards the Lord's table, a place where we focus in on this fact that to him a day is as a thousand, <laughs> and a thousand is one. You realize that thousands of years ago, people were doing exactly what we're doing today, gathering before the Lord to receive grace from him that he desires to lavish on. Prepare your hearts for that today. A reminder that we are receiving in one kind. The ushers are going to release starting on this side, moving to the back, and then coming back towards the front. Please fill the entire altar and don't feel as though you have to be closer to anyone than you need to. There is plenty, ample space here at the foot of the cross. Also, extend your hands and receive from the Lord today his gracious offering to you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Let's enter in.
Let us stand. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give them thanks and praise. It is right and our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. And as our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Hallelujah. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him in the fullness of time. Put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.